Book Four, Chapter Eight, Part One of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book Four, Chapter Eight, Part One. Chapter Eight: The Polity Settled by Moses, and How He Disappeared from Among Mankind. When forty years were completed, within thirty days, Moses gathered the congregation together near Jordan, where the city Abila now stands, a place full of palm trees. And all the people being come together, he spake thus to them: O you Israelites and fellow soldiers who have been partners with me in this long and uneasy journey. Since it is now the will of God, and the course of old age at a hundred and twenty requires it that I should depart out of this life, and since God has forbidden me to be a patron or an assistant to you in what remains to be done beyond Jordan, I thought it reasonable not to leave off my endeavors even now for your happiness, but to do my utmost to procure for you the eternal enjoyment of good things and a memorial for myself. When you shall be in the fruition of great plenty and prosperity, come therefore. Let me suggest to you by what means you may be happy and may leave an eternal prosperous possession thereof to your children after you. And then let me thus go out of the world. And I cannot but deserve to be believed by you, both on account of the great things I have already done for you, and because when souls are about to leave the body, they speak with the sincerest freedom. O children of Israel, there is but one source of happiness for all mankind: the favor of God, for He alone is able to give good things to those that deserve them, and to deprive those of them that sin against Him. Towards whom, if you behave yourselves according to His will and according to what I, who well understand His mind, do exhort you to, you will both be esteemed blessed and will be admired by all men, and will never come into misfortunes. Nor cease to be happy. You will then preserve the possession of the good things you already have, and will quickly obtain those that you are at present in want of. Only do you be obedient to those whom God would have you to follow. Nor do you prefer any other constitution of government before the laws now given you. Neither do you disregard that way of divine worship which you now have, nor change it for any other form. And if you do this. You will be the most courageous of all men in undergoing the fatigues of war, and will not be easily conquered by any of your enemies. For while God is present with you to assist you, it is to be expected that you will be able to despise the opposition of all mankind, and great rewards of virtue are proposed for you, if you preserve that virtue through your whole lives. Virtue itself is indeed the principal and the first reward. And after that, it bestows abundance of others, so that your exercise of virtue towards other men will make your own lives happy and render you more glorious than foreigners can be, and procure you an undisputed reputation with posterity. These blessings you will be able to obtain in case you hearken to and observe those laws which, by divine revelation, I have ordained for you. That is, in case you withal meditate upon the wisdom that is in them, I am going from you myself, rejoicing in the good things you enjoy, and I recommend you to the wise conduct of your law, to the becoming order of your polity, and to the virtues of your commanders, who will take care of what is for your advantage, and that God, who has been till now your leader, and by whose good will I have myself been useful to you. Will not put a period now to his providence over you, but as long as you desire to have him your protector in your pursuits after virtue, so long will you enjoy his care over you. Your high priest also Eleazar, as well as Joshua with the Senate and chief of your tribes, will go before you and suggest the best advices to you. By following which advices, you will continue to be happy. To whom you do give ear without reluctance. As sensible that all such as know well how to be governed will also know how to govern, if they be promoted to that authority themselves, and do not you esteem liberty to consist in opposing such directions as your governors think fit to give you 
for your practice. As at present, indeed, you place your liberty in nothing else but abusing your benefactors, which error, if you can avoid for the time to come, your affairs will be in a better condition than they have hitherto been. Nor do you ever indulge such a degree of passion in these matters as you have oftentimes done when you have been very angry at me, for you know that I have been oftener in danger of death from you than from our enemies. What I now put you in mind of is not done in order to reproach you, for I do not think it proper, now I am going out of the world, to bring this to your remembrance in order to leave you offended at me, since at the time when I underwent those hardships from you, I was not angry at you, but I do it in order to make you wiser hereafter, and to teach you that this will be for your security. I mean that you never be injurious to those that preside over you, even when you are become rich, as you will be to a great degree when you have passed over Jordan, and are in possession of the land of Canaan. Since, when you shall have once proceeded so far by your wealth, as to a contempt and disregard of virtue, you will also forfeit the favor of God, and when you have made him your enemy, you will be beaten in war, and will have the land which you possess taken away again from you by your enemies, and this with great reproaches upon your conduct. You will be scattered over the whole world, and will, as slaves, entirely fill both sea and land. And when once you have had the experience of what I now say, you will repent and remember the laws you have broken when it is too late. Whence I would advise you, if you intend to preserve these laws, to leave none of your enemies alive when you have conquered them, but to look upon it as for your advantage to destroy them all, lest, if you permit them to live, you taste of their manners, and thereby corrupt your own proper institutions. I also do further exhort you to overthrow their altars and their groves, and whatsoever temples they have among them, and to burn all such, their nation and their very memory with fire. For by this means alone the safety of your own happy constitution can be firmly secured to you. And in order to prevent your ignorance of virtue, and the degeneracy of your nature into vice, I have also ordained you laws by divine suggestion, and a form of government, which are so good, that if you regularly observe them, you will be esteemed of all men the most happy. When he had spoken thus, he gave them the laws and the constitution of government written in a book, upon which the people fell into tears, and appeared already touched with the sense that they should have a great want of their conductor. Since they remembered what a number of dangers he had passed through, and what care he had taken of their preservation, they desponded about what would come upon them after he was dead, and thought they should never have another governor like him, and feared that God would then take less care of them when Moses was gone, who used to intercede for them. They also repented of what they had said to him in the wilderness when they were angry, and were in grief on those accounts, insomuch that the whole body of the people fell into tears with such bitterness that it was past the power of words to comfort them in their affliction. However, Moses gave them some consolation, and by calling them off the thought how worthy he was of their weeping for him, he exhorted them to keep to that form of government he had given them, and then the congregation was dissolved at that time. Accordingly, I shall now first describe this form of government which was agreeable to the dignity and virtue of Moses, and shall thereby inform those that read these antiquities what our original settlements were, and shall then proceed to the remaining histories. Now those settlements are all still in writing as he left them, and we shall add nothing by way of ornament, nor anything besides what Moses left us. Only we shall so far innovate as to digest the several kinds of laws into a regular system, for they were by him left in writing as they were accidentally scattered in their delivery, and as he upon inquiry had learned them of God on which account I have thought it necessary to premise this observation beforehand, lest any of my own countrymen should blame me as having been guilty of an offense herein. Now part of our constitution will include the laws that belong to our political state. As for those laws which Moses left concerning our common conversation and intercourse one with another, 
I have reserved that for a discourse concerning our manner of life, and the occasions of those laws, which I propose to myself, with God's assistance, to write after I have finished the work I am now upon. When you have possessed yourselves of the land of Canaan, and have leisure to enjoy the good things of it, and when you have afterward determined to build cities, if you will do what is pleasing to God, you will have a secure state of happiness. Let there be then one city in the land of Canaan, and this situate in the most agreeable place for its goodness, and very eminent in itself, and let it be that which God shall choose for himself by prophetic revelation. Let there also be one temple therein, and one altar, not reared of hewn stones, but of such as you gather together at random, which stones, when they are whited over with mortar, will have a handsome appearance, and be beautiful to the sight. Let the ascent to it be not by steps, but by an acclivity of raised earth. And let there be neither an altar nor a temple in any other city, for God is but one, and the nation of the Hebrews is but one. He that blasphemeth God, let him be stoned, and let him hang upon a tree all that day, and then let him be buried in an ignominious and obscure manner. Let those that live as remote as the bounds of the land which the Hebrews shall possess, come to that city where the temple shall be, and this three times in a year, that they may give thanks to God for his former benefits, and may entreat him for those they shall want hereafter, and let them by this means maintain a friendly correspondence with one another by such meetings and feastings together, for it is a good thing for those that are of the same stock, and under the same institution of laws, not to be unacquainted with each other. Each acquaintance will be maintained by thus conversing together, and by seeing and talking with one another, and so renewing the memorials of this union. For if they do not thus converse together continually, they will appear like mere strangers to one another. Let there be taken out of your fruits a tenth, besides that which you have allotted to give to the priests and Levites. This you may indeed sell in the country, but it is to be used in those feasts and sacrifices that are to be celebrated in the holy city, for it is fit that you should enjoy those fruits of the earth which God gives you to possess, so as may be to the honor of the donor. You are not to offer sacrifices out of the hire of a woman who is a harlot, for the deity is not pleased with anything that arises from such abuses of nature, of which sort none can be worse than this prostitution of the body. In like manner, no one may take the price of the covering of a bitch, either of one that is used in hunting, or in keeping of sheep, and thence sacrifice to God. Let no one blaspheme those gods which other cities esteem such, nor may any one steal what belongs to strange temples, nor take away the gifts that are dedicated to any god. Let not any one of you wear a garment made of woolen and linen, for that is appointed to be for the priests alone. When the multitude are assembled together unto the holy city for sacrificing every seventh year at the Feast of Tabernacles, let the high priest stand upon a high desk, whence he may be heard, and let him read the laws to all the people. And let neither the women nor the children be hindered from hearing, no, nor the servants neither. For it is a good thing that those laws should be engraven in their souls, and preserved in their memories, that so it may not be possible to blot them out. For by this means they shall not be guilty of sin, when they cannot plead ignorance of what the laws have enjoined them. The laws also will have a greater authority among them, as foretelling what they will suffer if they break them, and imprinting in their souls by this hearing what they are commanded them to do, that so there may always be within their minds that intention of the laws which they have despised and broken, and have thereby been the causes of their own mischief. Let the children also learn the laws, as the first thing they are taught, which will be the best thing they can be taught, and will be the cause of their future felicity. Let every one commemorate before God the benefits which he bestowed upon them at their deliverance out of the land of Egypt, and this twice every day, both when the day begins and when the hour of sleep comes on, gratitude being in its own nature a just thing, and serving not only by way of return for past, but also by way of invitation of future favors. 
They are also to inscribe the principal blessings they have received from God upon their doors, and show the same remembrance of them upon their arms, as also they are to bear on their forehead and on their arm those wonders which declare the power of God and his good will towards them, that God's readiness to bless them may appear everywhere conspicuous about them. Let there be seven men to judge in every city, and these such as have been before most zealous in the exercise of virtue and righteousness. Let every judge have two officers allotted him out of the tribe of Levi. Let those that are chosen to judge in the several cities be had in great honor. And let none be permitted to revile any others when these are present, nor to carry themselves in an insolent manner to them, it being natural that reverence towards those in high offices among men should procure men's fear and reverence towards God. Let those that judge be permitted to determine according as they think to be right, unless any one can show that they have taken bribes to the perversion of justice, or can allege any other accusation against them, whereby it may appear that they have passed an unjust sentence, for it is not fit that causes should be openly determined out of regard to gain, or to the dignity of the suitors, but that the judges should esteem what is right before all other things, otherwise God will by that means be despised and esteemed inferior to those, the dread of whose power has occasioned the unjust sentence. For justice is the power of God. He therefore that gratifies those in great dignity supposes them more potent than God himself. But if these judges are unable to give a just sentence about the causes that come before them, which case is not unfrequent in human affairs, let them send the cause undetermined to the holy city, and there let the high priest, the prophet, and the Sanhedrim determine as it shall seem good to them. But let not a single witness be credited, but three, or two at the least, and those such whose testimony is confirmed by their good lives. But let not the testimony of women be admitted, on account of the levity and boldness of their sex nor let the servants be admitted to give testimony on account of the ignobility of their soul, since it is probable that they may not speak truth, either out of hope of gain or fear of punishment. But if any one be believed to have borne false witness, let him, when he is convicted, suffer all the very same punishments which he against whom he bore witness was to have suffered. If a murder be committed in any place, and he that did it be not found, nor is there any suspicion upon one as if he had hated the man, and so had killed him, let there be a very diligent inquiry made after the man, and rewards proposed to any one who will discover him. But if still no information can be procured, let the magistrates and senate of those cities that lie near the place in which the murder was committed, assemble together, and measure the distance from the place where the dead body lies then let the magistrates of the nearest city thereto purchase a heifer, and bring it to a valley, and to a place wherein there is no land ploughed or trees planted, and let them cut the sinews of the heifer, then the priests and Levites, and the senate of that city, shall take water and wash their hands over the head of the heifer, and they shall openly declare that their hands are innocent of this murder, and that they have neither done it themselves, nor been assisting to any that did it. They shall also beseech God to be merciful to them, that no such horrid act may any more be done in that land. End of Book 4, Chapter 8, Part 1